Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, the creator and host of the award-winning podcast that you're listening to right now, thank you so much, called Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. It is a daily podcast, 365 days a year, and each day we talk to an author about all of the things related to their career, their book, their life, and more in 30 minutes or less, because who has time? I am now an author myself, although I wasn't when I started this podcast, and you can get my new memoir, Bookends, a memoir of love, loss, and literature, wherever books are sold starting July 1st, and my children's book, Princess Charming. You can learn more about me at zibbyowens.com, but really, you're here to learn more about the authors, and that is what we're going to do. Also, be sure to check out all the other podcasts in the Zcast Podcast Network. You can learn more at zcastnetwork.com. Dot com and definitely check out those shows as well. I hope you'll all check out the all new Zibby Mag, Z I B B Y M A G, the literary lifestyle destination with essays, book news, a lit lifestyle feature, and even some classes. Check it out, zibbymag.com. Krithana Ramasetti is the author of Dava Shastri's Last Day. This is one of the special guest-hosted episodes, this one by Alicia Fernandez-Miranda, who is the author of our first Zibby book coming out next year called My What If Year. Kirthana is a former entertainment reporter for Newsday and the New York Daily News. Kirthana has written her fair share of stories about the lives and deaths of the rich and famous. She has a master's degree in creative writing from Emerson College, and her work has been published in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Entertainment Weekly, The Atlantic, and elsewhere. Dava Shastri's Last Day, a Good Morning America book club pick, is her first novel, and she lives in New York City. Hi, everybody. I am so excited to be here for Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. On behalf of Zibby, I'm Alicia Miranda, and I am here today with Kirthana Ramasetti, the author of Dava Shastri's Last Day, which has already made huge waves in hardcover and is going to be out in paperback on September 27th. So, Kirthana, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I have to tell you that I read this book in less than 48 hours. I wept through at least half of it, I think. I, like, cried a lot. I loved the family dynamics element. My professional background before I got into writing has always been in philanthropy, so I found your take Mm -hmm. on the philanthropic field fascinating. And weirdly, there were a lot of things that Dava thought that I had also thought about my own life. And I'm trying to decide if that's a good thing or a bad thing for my eventual future or not. So maybe you can let me know. But I absolutely loved your book. Thank you for bringing it into the world. And uh, I would love if you could just start by telling everybody here a little bit about what the book is about. So my novel is about an Indian American female philanthropist and billionaire And so when she learns she has a terminal illness, she decides to announce her death early so she can read her obituaries. And she does this because she's always been preoccupied with her legacy and how the world will perceive her. And so she's just very curious to know what the coverage will be after she passes. But this plan backfires on her when her two biggest secrets are revealed to the world. And so with the limited time she has left, she must make amends with her four adult children while also coming to terms with uh, the choices she has made throughout her life. It was amazing how much happened over such a brief period and, you know, in which the book was taking place, you know, this short time in which they're together. How did you come up with the idea for it? Sure. So I used to work as an entertainment journalist. And in that role, one of the major stories that we would cover is celebrity deaths. So anytime a celebrity passed away, one of the first things I would do in terms of writing an obituary or any related coverage is go to social media and see the real-time reaction to this person's passing. And I was greatly moved by like the outpouring of uh, affection and sadness over this news of a person's passing, but then also like made me have this weird thought, which is, do other celebrities see what I said about this person mm. and wonder what we said about them when their time comes? And so that thought just kind of stayed with me for years until one day I was like, well, what if somebody was so obsessed with how would they be perceived after they die, they actually would announce their death early just so they could re- read the coverage. And so that's how the novel was born. Do you think you would want to know what people were saying about you after you died? Absolutely not. I definitely <laughs> I <think> would not. <laughs> no good would come from that. But I just, one of the interesting things coming up with that premise is like, okay, who is this person that would want to do that? And why would it be so important to them? Because I think most of us would have the reaction that we had is like, no. There's no, there's no point in knowing that, but 
that was one of the fun things and the challenging things about once I had this premise is figuring out who Dava was. Why would this be so important to her? Why would she want to read this and risk everything just to know what was being said about her? And I, that was what the first building block that I um, had to come up with in order to write this novel. I've read some pieces when that you kind of were interviewed in and things when the hardcover came out. And I know there's lots of comparisons to things like Succession. And was there anybody that you really had in mind or people that you looked at, either fictional characters or real-life inspiration for the story when you were kind of putting together who Dava was? I didn't actually. So much of who Dava was is worn out of this premise when I had to figure out, okay, I have a person who's going <laughs> to announce her death early so she can read her obituaries. Why would she do that? And it would have been very easy to go down the, the route of, okay, she's an actress, so she's a famous person in some way, a celebrity. But I thought it'd be much more interesting if part of her rationale for doing this is because she built a foundation or a business from the ground up. So the fact that she did this by herself, she didn't marry into wealth, she wasn't from a wealthy family, that is so much a part of her identity and how she sees herself. And she just wants to make sure that the rest of the world views her accomplishments the same way she does. So really, Dava's character is just working out the fact of, like, why she did this really strange and audacious thing. And let's talk a little bit about your own journey. So what was the jump from report, entertainment reporter to writing a novel? And now I know there's a second novel coming, too. That's right. So um, I actually received my MFA in creative writing about 20 years ago. And so it's always been a dream of mine to write a novel, but I've also very much always been into entertainment and pop culture. So for the past several years, I've been working in media and um, online journalism, mostly with the focus on entertainment. But I was always had this like, you know, loft preoccupation that when I do want to write this novel. And so eventually I got burned out in, in terms of journalism and media. And I was like, okay, let me figure out what I'm going to do next. And so as I was trying to figure that out, I thought, well, let me try to see if I could finally write, you know, my novel that I wanted to do for so long. I actually wrote two books before Dava that will never see the light of day. And so when I tried decide to write Dava, I'm like, okay, if I'm going to do this and really go for it, let, it make, let me make sure it's filled with all the things that I am personally preoccupied by and obsessed by. So that's family and legacy, pop culture. Music, so much music and in music, the book. So much music. So I kind of took all these things that have great interest to me and are very meaningful to me and kind of found a way to take that premise and all these elements that are of interest to me and kind of build a novel out of it. And so what was important to me in writing this novel is because I've written two books previous to this one and I didn't see them through, I, I just decided not to pursue them. I thought, well, if I'm going to spend more time writing a novel... Let me make sure it's personally meaningful to me. So even if it doesn't see the light of day, at least I got something out of writing it. it. Yeah. And it ended up being one of the great creative joys of my life. So I'm so happy that I worked out. It's like a cherry on top that actually got published. But I remember at the time while writing it, I'm like, this is so fulfilling in a way that nothing else I've done before has. So I just feel very lucky. I had so much fun reading it, which makes me feel like you must have had so much fun writing it. So I totally feel that. And what was your kind of journey to publication like? Sure. So I had a very unusual <laughs> journey to publication. I worked on this book for about two years. I had several people read it, which was so helpful during the, uh, the revision process, especially. And so I started querying in February of 2020. Oh, fine. Um, <laughs> yes, exactly. And I ended up receiving four offers of representation, which was incredible. And then I decided to sign with my current agent, Andrea Somberg at Harvard Klinger literary agency in March. And this happened to be the day before the world changed. Oh, it was right before, the day before um, Tom Hanks announced he was positive for COVID. It was the day before the NBA shut down for the season. And we just realized, okay, nothing will ever be the same. And so I was like, great, I finally have an agent after this long journey. And now the world is just, you know, oh. we don't know what's going to happen. But uh, to my agent's credit, she was amazing. She said, let's just wait a week before we go out with it, which is what we did. And then by April 1st, we had an offer, a preempt offer. That's so amazing. it just moved incredibly fast. Yeah. And I did see a post on your Instagram sharing that you got an email rejection sometime this year from a query that you had submitted in 2020. Is that right? <laughs> that is right. I was so shocked. I was like, why is an agent emailing me about 
this novel because it had a different title at the time. Right. And it said Queer the Matriarch, which is a title at the time. And it was so confusing. And then there was a rejection. And I was like, huh, <laughs> that's interesting. Because goes to show you, even if you get published, you can still be rejected. And that's a lesson I try to share on Instagram. Like, you just have to kind of roll with it. Because all you really do is need one yes, which is what I learned throughout that whole queer writing process. It's so nice because I feel like you do hear a lot about people's successes on social media. So it's really nice. I always love to share that I queered 41 agents, queried 41 agents before I got my agent. And I'm like, listen, it can happen. It can happen. You just have to kind of persevere. And sometimes you just have to find the right person. But it's very easy to just brush all those things to the side, I think, when you have a success because, you know, you may not want to think about them, but it's so helpful for others who are in different stages of their process. Completely. So how has your life changed since the book came out? Like, I have to know, because you've had the, the hardcover's been out for a while. I know there's an HBO Max series that's coming, I think, about the book. You're working on a second book. Like, how are things different from that kind of February 2020, you're querying, hoping somebody's going to pick it up till now? That's such a good question. I've never really thought of it that way. But I think the the biggest thing that's changed for me is, like, if you're a reader or a writer and had a lifelong dream to publish a novel, it's kind of incredible when you actually realize that dream. Because I didn't expect to realize it. I'm over 40. I got this book published when I was 41. And so to actually fulfill the thing you've been dreaming about since you were a little kid is kind of surreal and amazing. And so everything that's happened after that has just been kind of like a pinch me moment because nothing will ever top the moment when I realized, okay, I do have a book deal. This is going to happen. And then seeing the book on shelves. So my life has changed in the fact that I can actually say, I'm not ever no longer nagged by this thing where I'm like, I just have to do this one lifelong thing that I was dreaming of. I did that. So I can let that dream be. And I don't have that anxiety and pressure on that anymore. And that's, I think, the biggest thing for me. I can just kind of move forward and be happy. Like no matter what else happens, because publishing has a lot of ups and downs and shifts and changes. But I did this one thing I always dreamed of. And that means the world to me. That's so awesome. I imagine when you first saw the book in shelves and it got picked up by book clubs and there was so much, it must have just felt like pinch me, pinch me, pinch me all the time. Completely. I mean, the thing about living with a book and working on a book for years, those characters just live in your head and nobody else knows about them. Me personally, I didn't share that book with anybody for the longest time because it was too personal to me. This yeah. was like my give it all kind of project, like go big or go home. <laughs> this was it. So it was too much to share with anyone else. So I just kind of kept those characters with me and didn't really talk about the book or the novel at all. So it's so wonderful when those characters are now no longer just live inside my head, but other people relate to them and discuss them and talk about how a particular character's journey means so much to them. That's one of like, the most amazing things about this, too. I know it's a novel, but are there any characters that you really put yourself into in the book? So in terms of... One of the funniest things about like doing interviews for this book, when people ask, like, who, you know, do you relate to your character? How you like your main character? I'm like, well... We're both billionaires, obviously. Obviously. <laughs> which is not true. But the one thing that Dava and I share, of course, is our love of music. Music was really important to me when I was a teenager. I always like to say that reading and writing were just like oxygen to me. It was just like breathing. But music came later when I was younger. And probably for most of us, like when we were in high school. Mm. And so I remember feeling for the first time, whereas with reading and writing, or especially reading, I should say, Help me like look out into the world and mm-hmm. experience different things I would ever otherwise experience the lives and the characters in these books. But with music, for the first time, I was going inward and was kind of reflecting. Okay, what's on? Where are my dreams? What is my? What is my goals? What do I think about anything? And music awakened that inner self for me. And so I really wanted to give that to Daba, and show how music shaped the course of her life and helped her dream her life, dream herself into the life she always wanted. And so it was incredibly cool and meaningful to give that aspect to myself and give it to Dava and to show the role music played from like the earliness, the early part of her life all the way to the very end. One thing that I thought was so awesome is that I have my music taste cue like very basic. It's a lot of Broadway, a lot of pop, a lot of Latin. So not tons of overlap in genre with what Dava liked, but it didn't matter if I didn't know the artists that she was talking about or the albums that she was talking about. It It just... It didn't matter at all. And I know they weren't all, I guess they were not all real. Of course, Tom Buck is not going to be real, right? So it just, and then I saw, you know, you had a playlist in some of your content after, but it did, it like, it didn't matter that I didn't know that music because 
I could relate it to music that would have that kind of impact on me. And it just, it really transports you somewhere in this way that I think, you know, your other senses can also transport you places, but there's just something about music and how it can bring you back to a specific moment in your life, almost like a time machine, right? Oh, a hundred percent. That was one of the coolest things about writing this book is I had used to have a, a giant CD collection and I kind of got rid of it one day because we all moved on to like, you know, iPods and then our iPhones. I'm yeah. like, I don't need like this physical collection of music. And then uh, I rewrited it ever since. But when I decided to write Dava's Journey with music, I had to go back and revisit the music that I used to listen to. Mm-hmm. So I actually have a running list for every album I used to own, <laughs> just so I could like, have that memory. And I would listen to all this music. And then also, I don't want Dava just to be me. I want Dava to be her own person. Right. And in the novel, she's actually a few years older than me. So it was a great way to be introduced to other music as well that I think Dava would connect with, like PJ Harvey, for mm-hmm. example. And all this music that I didn't listen to at the time when I was growing up, but I had a chance to listen to through Dava's ears. So it was it was a really fun time just to kind of listen to. I wrote, listened to music throughout the writing of this novel. Some music I had listened to all my life, some music I had discovered for the first time. And then the weird and interesting part about this whole process is that this novel also turned me into a songwriter in a way. No way! Um, I'm not sure if you know this, but in the book, uh, there's a song written about Daba by the character Tom Buck. Correct, I remember that. And, yes. Did and you so write that I song, write, I assume? I wrote the lyrics. I'm not a poet. I'm not a songwriter, but I had to write lyrics. So those are the lyrics I wrote. And at the time I was drafting this novel, I was teaching myself the ukulele. So I started getting this melody in, stuck in my head for the chorus of the song. So... I took my iPhone and recorded myself playing the ukulele, singing along to the song, Daba. Cut to two years later, when the audiobook team at my publishing company says, we want to produce that as original song. Do you have any ideas? What? (laughs) And I said, I do, because I actually have the melody. I recorded myself two years ago. I sent them the video myself, and they turned it into the most beautiful, gorgeous song that I can't believe I had a hand in writing. And so it's on my website. It's on the audiobook if anyone wants to. Oh learn. my God, that is a hot tip. I'm going to do that as soon as we hang up this call. <laughs> but that's the amazing thing about this novel. It's given to me so many gifts. And one of them is turning me, like I always want to be a published writer, published author, but I never thought I'd have a hand in writing music as well. And it gave me so much more appreciation of artists and songwriters and what they do because I don't know how well I pulled it off but the fact I even had a hands in an original song is just amazing to me that's so cool maybe Dava Shastri the musical like coming to a Broadway theater near you you could write the <laughs> score for it why not I know you like Hamilton um, Hamilton got some shout outs in your book so yes it's <laughs> You never know. You're right. You're right. You, never know. you never know. I would see. I would sign up and see that musical. Actually, I think this is what the world is missing. Maybe like this kind of great uh, American legacy musical. That's so awesome. Well, I mean, tell us a little bit. There's so much on the horizon for you. So give us a little plug for all the things coming up next. Sure. So I actually have a second novel coming out in April of 2023. It's called Abrika and the Hollywood Wives. And I have to admit that was inspired by a binge watch of Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Yes. You know? <laughs> um, I watched a lot of Bravo during the pandemic and I think it seeped into my brain. So the novel is about a young Indian American screenwriter who is mourning the death of her twin sister. And to pay the bills, because she's an aspiring screenwriter, she's working on a lot of A-list after parties. So while working at the Governor's Ball, which is the after party for the Oscars, she meets a very successful Oscar-winning film producer. And so they have a role in courtship and end up getting married after a few months. And a month after their marriage, her husband's first wife passes away. And in her will, she says to Avika, divorce him and I'll give you a $1 million and a reel of film. <gasps> and so she is shaken out of her love fog. Her love fog. She's like, who did I marry? And so she decides to investigate her new husband through the eyes and experiences of his exes, which is an actress, a pop star, and a reality star. Oh, my God. I'm so into it already. <laughs> is it? Well, I assume it's done. April. Pub date April. So you must be yeah, done now, yeah? The <gasps> cover if you want. I, you can't show it on the podcast, but I wanted to show it to you. So, yes, it'll be out April 2023. How's the experience writing your second book? Or your not your second book, but your second to-be-published book, I should say. I thought I think we all as published debut novelists think, oh, the second one will be easier. And it's not. 
<laughs> you have to climb. You have to climb that mountain all over again. And you're starting at like base camp, and you're looking up, and like, oh, that peak is so far away. So it was a challenge, especially because now you're kind of a known quantity. Like people have a certain expectation. Some right. people or some readers have the expectation of who you are, what what you write about. So all of that was kind of on my shoulders as I was writing this. But it was also a lot of fun. I think what I've learned through writing Dava and now writing this new novel is I just need to inject something that's a real interest and passion to me and also find ways to make it fun and interesting to write. Yeah. And so it was very challenging, but it was also a lot of fun. It's funny, I working on a novel now and it's like I'm I'm kind of doing the editing and the drafting phase and I had an idea for like another novel the other day. And then I was like, I could not possibly, like, how could I possibly do this of over again? It's like this constant repeat. It's kind of like childbirth where you forget and then you go through it again because you forgot what happened the first time. And I feel like writing is sort of like that. I'm like, this is going to be great. <laughs> and then you just start a new project and you're like, mm, oh my God, what have I done? At least once the baby's out in the world, it doesn't require so much maintenance, I suppose, uh, as an actual child. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> so my normal podcast is called Quit Your Day Job. So I have to know, if you were not writing, what else would you be doing right now? If I if I could do anything I wanted or if it's just like other things I could be doing if I wasn't writing. Anything you wanted. Your dream. Okay. My dream. I always thought, because music is a big part of like who I am and foundational to me, I always thought it'd be a lot of fun to be a music supervisor on a TV series. I just finished watching The Bear. If, I don't know if you've heard of it. It's a show on FX. It's about people working in a restaurant in Chicago. And the music cues, the music drops are just really amazing and so well-timed. And I always thought it'd be so much fun to the person who listens to all the music from all the different albums and just times them for certain scenes. That would be my dream. I just That's think that an awesome job. Fun. You could write it and then also you could put the music in. You could just do both. Sure, why not? Yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> we always like to ask what advice you have for aspiring writers who are listening to this and thinking they would want nothing more than to be able to be just like you. Oh, I think, I mean, I think it's kind of what I've said earlier because I've written two books before Dava, and then when I came time at tackling Dava, I had to think about what do I do differently this time that didn't work the previous two times. And for me, again, it was about, okay, what can I inject into this book that is so passionate and personal to me? And something that will sustain me writing it for years, because as we were just talking about, you work on a book for years, and you have to have <laughs> so much interest and passion that will get you back into your chair every day, mm. sit at your desk, get to your laptop. So you have to find something that will sustain you over a long period of time. So really think about what you're writing about and why you're writing about it, because that's what's going to keep you going every day. And the other thing is just think about your process in a way. I really have to change my process for writing this book. And that's it's what re- writing this book affected for me before I was at quote unquote cancer, which means I kind of came up with the idea as I went along. Mm-hmm. But because my debut novel has such a big cast of characters, I just thought that wouldn't work. I had to figure out things ahead of time. And that's what I did. I outlined the novel in advance and that really worked for me. And I don't think everyone should have to, you don't have to decide if you're a cancer or a plotter, but just give yourself a lot of thought about what do I, can I do for myself to make this book a lot easier to write and help me kind of keep going every day. So I figured out a system for myself that really worked, that I took into my second novel. And I think that could be really helpful if you just gave it a lot of thought about how you're going to write this novel beyond the idea itself, how you make it easier for yourself to kind of sustain every day. Yeah, that's such good advice. Do you, so for your first, did you finish your first two novels that you wrote? Did you kind of abandon them mid through, midway through? Oh, no, they're, they're completed drafts, they're completed, but yeah. I found myself bored at a certain point. And if I'm bored as the author, why would anyone else be interested mm. in them? So that's why I decided to Fair set enough. them aside. Well, good yeah. thing that you started Dava Shastri's Last Day, a book that I completely loved. And this has been such a great chat. Where can listeners find out more information about you, what you're working on, and things happening with your book? Sure. So you can visit my website, which is kirthameramaseti.com. I'm on Twitter at popscribblings.com. Love it. And then also, <laughs> I came up with that Twitter handle when I was still an entertainment journalist. And I was like, do I want my name associated with? This is so long ago. Anyway, so that's why <laughs> Twitter is Pop Scribbling. But Instagram is just my name, Kirtan Aramasay. Amazing. Kirtan, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thank you so much for having me. This is so fun. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. 
Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music.